Welcome to Oregon Voters Digest, the program that brings forward the social and political issues that are important to people living here in the Pacific Northwest. And now, your host, Bruce Broussard. Hi, you're on. An, you're watching another episode of Oregon Voters Digest. My name is Teresa Griffin Kennedy, and uh, Bruce asked me to host today's full show. Um, when Bruce contacted me about a week ago um, and asked me to host the show, I had two people in mind immediately that I thought of, um, and that's Cameron Witten and Gregory Robert McKelvey. So, hi you guys, welcome to the show. Hi, <laughs> thanks for having us, Teresa. <laughs> Good to be with you. Yeah, I actually um, was surprised. I've, I've, I've hosted two other shows, and he contacted me and said that I would have the full hour today, and I thought, I know who I want to ask to be on, because... Um, I've been watching the protests, and I have seen you guys on TV, and it seems like the times that you were you were able to make statements, you felt really rushed because, you know, they don't give you a lot of time. So I thought this would be a good opportunity for you both to be able to contribute more than a 20-second soundbite. <laughs> so, um, so Cameron Witten, you're a PSU graduate, and you're the executive director at Know Your City. That is correct. Yay. <laughs> I remember you um, when you were running for mayor yeah. and wearing... The, the I called it the box project. Yeah. <laughs> and I remember Don and I were on the bus and we were downtown. It was really cold and I saw you out there and I waved. <laughs> um, and then I remember your your hunger strike yeah. and I sent you a friend a uh, Facebook a Facebook message and I asked you please stop stop your hunger strike. You've got to be healthy. Um, anyway, um, we also have Gregory Robert McKel McKelvey and you graduated from Oregon State University Correct. and you're a, a law student currently. That's amazing. I law is I took a class, uh, and it's pretty tough. Yeah, I, I don't recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> it's so dry and it's so technical, and I just don't have the mind for it. But, sure. um, but you're also the you were the campaign manager for James Offsink for Oregon State District 21. Correct. And you have a new job that's coming up. Um, I have a couple offers. I'm still waiting to see where would I go with. Cool. So, yeah. And I know that you'll do well because I know that you will get some great offers. I just know it. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> um, so I got some. I had some private messages from people on Facebook. Um, a couple were pretty, you know, animated. Well, what about, you know, all the damage to the property? And what about, uh, you know, stopping traffic? And ask them this and ask them that. And I know that um, the media has attempted to spin um, what you and Cameron are doing um, and kind of try to make it seem like um, the, the real protesters, the real sincere activists are out there destroying property and starting fires. I know that's not true. Um, what would you say to um, people who lump in the peaceful protesters with the anarchists who are out causing trouble and stuff? Um, one, I think it's not fair to blame an entire political ideology for the actions of individuals, um, that of anarchism specifically, um, but also of our ideologies uh, to blame us for the actions of yeah. individuals. Um, I also think it's important to respect the diversity of tactics, and while I disagree with going out and smashing things or property, um, I do think I have more in common with those people that are so angry that they do that than I do with Donald Trump. Um, but my tactic and our organization's tactic is always going to be peace, and uh, we are going to continue holding peaceful events, and we believe the best way to advocate for that is to do so uh, by leading by example. Yeah, yeah. And just to, to, to continue that conversation, I think that this country, um, we have seen so many movements that um, a big part of their foundation was the destruction of property. We yeah. don't sit here and decry the founding fathers when they had the Tea Party. Uh, we yeah, don't talk about right. women's suffrage or the abolition of slavery. All of these things um, had a big part, big component of property damage. Mm -hmm. uh, while I also am a person who is not out there looking to set fires right. to dumpsters and whatnot, um, we do have to realize that people are enraged right now right. and as Martin Luther King yeah. said uh, riot is the cry of the unheard right. um, we are dealing with a very huge crisis we're dealing with a right. national crisis in this country right. and while I'm not happy to see what happened I'm not surprised yeah I um, I agree with uh, with most of what you're saying um, if not all of what you're saying I didn't vote for Donald Trump there was I mean no way that I could ever vote for him. I think he's an aberration. I call him tr uh, Clown Trump whenever I post, which is about every day I post something negative about him, um, which is reflective of the truth, you know, things he said mm -hmm. on video that he de later denied saying on video. Um, but he's Clown Trump to me. <coughs> he's not my president. <laughs> yeah. um, but it's kind of, I, I've been really stunned how um, divided people are, you know, and, and the people that I thought were, you know, 
more intelligent, I guess. I, that might sound elitist, but, you know, that they would vote for someone like him. I mean, he's a he's an admitted sexual predator. He's a criminal. Um, I guess I should be more, um, more uh, unbiased, in my opinion, of Donald Trump, but I was just horrified. And my husband and I didn't vote for him. We voted for Hillary. Um, and we wanted to, we wanted to support um, Bernie Sanders, but that didn't, you know, that didn't work hmm. out, um, unfortunately. But, um, but yeah, um, it's, it's been pretty discouraging seeing all of the, uh, the anger. And, and also it's been enlightening because I've seen so much um, animosity and so much, I think, hidden racism come to the forefront that I had never seen before as a white person that I had never seen before, um, especially in the city of Portland. And so um, what are your thoughts on that? <laughs> well, I have a lot of thoughts. Mm -hmm. you know, I agree with you that um, I'm angry. I'm enraged. Yeah. Uh, I've not been on this planet very long, but I'm very confident when I say that Donald Trump has to be the most unqualified person oh to be close to the White House. Yes. Um, we're really in jeopardy. Um, oh, we're yeah. looking both at uh, domestic disasters, but also right. uh, international diplomatic disasters. Yeah. Um, and then uh, as of somebody who is young, poor, queer, low income, marginalized in so many uh, ways, um, I know the people, the communities who were on the front lines, who bled and died and cried uh, sure. for my rights. Right. And we're seeing decades, literally decades of civil rights progress. Right. Threatened, being threatened to be dialed back. Yeah. And, you know, and what can we rights. do? Exactly. Yeah. Women's rights. I mean that. Civil rights of yeah. all people. Um, how do we fight against that. This yeah. is the opportunity for us to build a real coalition, mm -hmm. to really have a purpose, and to resist Trump. Yeah. I tell you to people all the time, yes, Donald Trump might have won the Electoral College. That does not mean that his hateful agenda is going to win. Right. So what does that mean for our communities? Um, I've been inspired so far to see what's happening in Portland with Portland Resistance, mm -hmm. Don't Shoot Portland, mm -hmm. other groups who've been organizing this community. And uh, I think that we should actually take a great lesson from the Tea Party, because mm -hmm. ever since you know Barack Obama first became a, a national name, they've been organizing against him. And after eight years, they were successful in electing the first orange president. So uh, <laughs> yeah, so how do we <laughs> learn from that? How do we yeah. continue to stay committed to justice, to uplifting the terrible actions and behavior of Donald Trump, and keep that going until yeah. the next electoral cycle, because he cannot be reelected? Well, there's some talk that he will be impeached. There's that professor of law, Alan something or other. Dershowitz. Uh, it's not him, it's this other... Bateman. I think that was, yeah. And he, um, ha he wrote an article like two weeks ago and he said, you know, he, and he predicted, he predicted who would be the president for the last 30 years or something. Um, and he says he's going to be impeached. And I, I, I hope so because um, I, I've seen, you know, I think we've all seen nationally this trend toward overt acts of racism. I mean, in Beaverton, mm -hmm. the, the, the young black woman who had a, a brick thrown at her middle. Mm -hmm. I mean... And uh, and then um, also a couple, a few days ago, two, three days ago, um, my husband Donna were driving to town and we saw some graffiti on the base of the suicide bridge, the Vista Bridge, and I posted about it and I am amazed at the response that I got on Facebook, which was there were four or five black women from Portland who posted and agreed it's racist and offensive what was said, Jesus is a, the N-word, um, and then all of these other people white people from out of state primarily posted saying, well, we don't really know the context, or it could be considered art. And it's like in the last 24 hours, I've been made to feel attacked and like I'm a bad person because I spoke out against it. I can't remember seeing that kind of graffiti on the base of the Vista Bridge in the 12 years I've lived in Southwest Portland. Mm -hmm. So to me, it was significant and it was it, it, it happened, I think it happened, perhaps as a response to Trump, because I think another thing that people don't consider is his language. Trump's language gives other people who are a little less introspective the permission to be hateful. So I think that, um, and this goes into the election of Donald Trump, that our country has like an extreme lack of empathy here, and we're still at the at the point where we have to convince people that racism still exists. Um, and yes. if you don't believe that racism exists, yet a majority of black people do not just think it, but feel it, um, if you are of the opinion that they are wrong, what you are saying is that a majority of black people are delusional, which is 
in itself racist. Right. Um, so if a black person tells you that something is racist, a white person doesn't get to then say, no, it isn't, yeah. because you're not the one feeling that. So right. I think that we need right. to come into these discussions with the with the notion that a, an acceptance of being a victim is not fun. It's not um, fun to come out and say, I feel victimized or threatened by uh, the graffiti that I saw. And it takes a lot of courage to come out and say that you're a victim. And that goes for the victims of everything, sexual yeah. assault, yeah. Um, sexism, homophobia, xenophobia, yeah. Islamophobia, anything. Um, and I think that we should respect <laughs> the people coming up and saying, I feel victimized, rather than um, tell people from marginalized groups, if you're not from a marginalized group, no, that's not how you should feel. Right. Because um, I think uh, especially cisgendered white men, but white people in general, mm -hmm. Um, need to stop spending so much energy defending their actions um, and, and their intent and rather uh, uh, talk about the impact and the outcome. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. I mean, I, um, yeah. For me, that experience um, last night um, and the day before um, was kind of mind-boggling, but it, it, it was also reassuring to know that people from Portland get it because a lot of my white friends, several of my white friends were like, this is ridiculous, it's racist, it's offensive, it needs to come down. And a lot of these other people from out of state were defending it. But um, yeah, uh, you know, I, um, I, I... I guess I have a question on that. Based off of what you just experienced on Facebook and what we saw in this national election, mm -hmm. do you feel like you might be living in a bubble? Because I feel like most people yeah. did not expect Hillary yeah. Clinton to lose the Electoral College, yeah. and that happened. And you yeah. are like, oh, well, I saw on my page people that I know right. being really understanding, but then all the other people who I don't know. From out of state. Yeah. So do you feel like <laughs> you've been living like in a bubble? I do feel like I've been living in a bubble my whole life. I mean, I was born in Baker, and I moved to Portland when I was 18 months. I've lived in Portland my whole life. And it's only been since 2012, since I married my husband, Don, that um, I got to know black people personally because we have family members who are black. So I have, you know, we have like almost 20 family members from my husband's side of the family, from his, his son and his granddaughters and stepdaughters and other, you know, extended family that are black. And so I've, I feel like I've learned some things since that time. Um, and I guess I just didn't know how racist Portland is. <laughs> mm. I really didn't. I, I, so the I, last two years have been like pretty illuminating, especially since becoming friends with Fred Stewart. You know, um, Fred Stewart was on a panel with um, Chloe Udaly. You daily. You daily. Daily. Okay. <laughs> and um, and I'm glad that she won. I'm glad that she you know mm -hmm. beat Steve Novick. But but I did witness her say some things to him that were really not very considerate and. Um, and so I wrote about them, you know, I wrote a couple articles, but um, since getting to know um, my family members, my new family members through marriage and Fred and, you know, some other people, I, I feel like I've, my empathy has been uh, deepened, I guess. I, I think so. one of the problems we have in Portland is obviously a majority of our city isn't racist and a majority of our city actually would call themselves liberals or progressives. Yeah. But I think that too many people in our city are quick to post on Facebook, yes, I think that that uh, graffiti was wrong. Um, and not enough people are willing to go out and take the graffiti down or address the issues that lead to somebody posting something like that. Yeah. Um, and I think that's where us and our organization are trying to move people towards not just calling out racism that you see on Facebook, but why don't you go and take it down? Or why don't you go and address the reasons why people are saying these types mm -hmm. of things through graffiti? Yeah. Yeah, you know, a couple people said that, you know, you should you should um, get some people and, and paint over it or whatever, take it out. Well, it's, it would be dangerous for me to do that because it's on, on the base. I mean, I'd have to climb up and I, it's, it's like this really steep area. I'm not saying um, you specifically <laughs> and I'm more talking yeah. metaphorically. Well, um, and, and I did call the city of Portland. I called mm -hmm. the city of Portland and I left two messages. Um, and nobody, you know, nobody got back to me, but, you know, it was the other day, so it was like the weekend, but no one's gotten back to me, you know, today either, and I think they're supposed to check messages, the city of Portland is like mm -hmm. supposed to check messages every day, but no one's gotten back to me, and that was one of the things um, the KATU reporter wanted to know, has anyone gotten back to you? No, they haven't, but... Um, I think so many people in Portland um, are willing to say we don't, uh, we're not racist and we don't like racism, right. yet yeah. they do not shop at black-owned businesses, right. or they are still contributing to the gentrification in our right. city, so right. if you don't like racism, it's, it's, racism doesn't look like, I'm not racist, I haven't right. lynched a black person all year, right. it looks like, what <laughs> you doing to uplift people of color right in your and there was a woman on the Facebook thread and she asked me you know I, I'm always suspicious of people who try to prove how unracist they are I will admit in my life I've thought things that were racist 
I've said things that were racist, never overtly, never directly to a person of color, never to hurt them. But I will admit that about myself because most white people have and, and will at some, po at some point. But that doesn't mean that I'm doing that now and it doesn't mean that I'm, you know, it doesn't mean that I'm, I've, I've changed to a degree and that change is a continuous fluid process. Mm -hmm. But you were gonna say something. So especially in Portland, uh, so many people will say, I'm not racist. Right. I'm right. not like right. non-racism is like the new thing in, right. in Portland, um, how you can't be susceptible to racism because you're right. not racist. Right. And what we need in this country, because I think we can all be on the same page, that we are going into a new racist era in this country, mm -hmm. that there is racism here. And I don't want to hear just how you are not racist. Right. I want to hear how if you really are bothered by racism, how are you actively working right. against racism? So right. you have to have people who are anti-racist. That's true. Yes. And you know, it's for myself as a, as a, as a, so, as an activist writer, which is really all I can do. That was why I wrote about Fred Stewart. And I wrote three different articles. One of them, I attacked Nigel Jacobs for being racist, for trying to portray Fred as the archetypal Negro savage. And that's what he did. And I took him on, and a lot of people were shocked. Oh my God, you wrote this article and you attacked Nigel Jaquist, Pulitzer Prize winner Nigel Jaquist? Yeah, I did, because he lied to Fred Stewart. And he said, I'm not writing an article about you. And he did. And he ruined his chances for city council. But um, so I agree that people have to um, get involved and, and do something to either open up discussion or bring awareness. And I've tried to do that, um, and I have gotten absolutely like, I mean, just crickets from from white people um, and, and also from black people. But I think another thing that's important to remember about Portland is I think what we have like 600,000 white people and 40,000 people of color, 40,000 black people in this city. That's us. I mean, the whitest city in Portland in, in, in the nation. And I never knew that. Mm -hmm. I never knew that Portland was the whitest city in the country. But I by guess design. It is. By design. Yeah. By yeah. design. And by I've sure. been learning about that, too, you know, from all the way down to when Oregon was founded and the flag and all of that and the laws and which is pretty discouraging but um but yeah um it's uh it's been interesting um so and anyway, how do you feel like you've been motivated to do something about it you know it's like what Gregory said about empathy mm -hmm. that's what did it for me okay I became friends with Fred I I I, I volunteered for his campaign mm -hmm. he's really really smart he knows the history of Northeast and North Portland better than anyone I know. I mean, his family's lived there for 40 years, and, and he's got other family that have lived in Portland for, forever. I mean, he knows all the dirt and the history of, of everybody. And he's also a real estate broker, and he knows about housing, and he knows about property, and he knows, I mean, he's like an encyclopedia, what he, you know, the things he knows about. So I encouraged him, and I supported him, and, um, and then Nigel Jaquis wrote the article about him and his daughter and I saw how much it hurt him and he was my friend and I felt so angry because he was so hurt by it mm -hmm. and it was it was it was sensationalism it was yellow journalism it mm -hmm. wasn't real journalism mm -hmm. um, and that kind of uh, that made me angry and when I get angry that's when I want to write something mm -hmm. so I will say um, I've had a lot of disagreements with the things that Nigel has written about I think he skews a little more libertarian for my than my taste um, but I don't know him personally, um, and and I know of Fred, but I've never had a deep conversation with him. But Chloe, yeah. I'm super close with, yeah. and, and I just want to put out there that I think she's great, excellent. Mm -hmm. I agree with almost all of her policies, and I think she's going to make an excellent uh, commissioner. I, I definitely am, am heartened to see someone who's so dedicated to um, focusing on housing for lower-income mm -hmm. people and for marginalized people, because Portland is unrecognizable. Yes, I, mean, yeah. I've, I grew up in Northwest Portland, the house that I grew up in, we lived there for 12 years. Mm -hmm. We moved in in 1968, the rent was $250 a month for about a four or five bedroom house. And I think it sold five years ago for $460,000. Mm -hmm. And it's it's a completely different part of town now. It is yuppie heaven. Mm -hmm. You go over there, you don't see kids on their bikes playing. You see people walking their dogs, you know, it's, it's just become this completely gentrified place. And uh, yeah, it's, it's wow. pretty depressing. <laughs> Yeah. Um, Portland is just, it's not the same town. And I mean, we we live in Washington County. Our address reads Portland, Oregon, but mm -hmm. we live in, in Beaverton. It's this weird annexed area mm -hmm. in West Slope. And we live in a house that we can afford, but there's no way that we could move to Portland, back to mm -hmm. Portland proper, mm -hmm. and be able to afford even a two-bedroom apartment. Mm -hmm. There's yeah, no we're, way. Yeah, we're pushing people out that 
d this is their city that made it mm -hmm. somewhere that people want to move to mm -hmm. and now the people that are moving there are pushing those people out yeah. um it, it, it's not it, we have to strike a balance because i feel like i'm a mix of this new portland portlandia or whatever because mm -hmm. I, li I like yoga mats and, and sure. juice bars <laughs> right. um, but too. not at the expense <laughs> of black owned businesses right. or black neighborhoods so now we have to strike a balance there. That's, actually, <laughs> that's actually a really good point and my husband don dupay gave you both a copy of his book um, when he was a police officer in the 60s there were a lot of black owned businesses in albina mm -hmm. it was also a very dangerous area because there was a lot of crime and a lot of drug activity but there were more black owned businesses in albina in the 60s and the 70s than there are today yeah, and more. there were more black people owning houses and fred mm -hmm. will tell you that because fred knows all the statistics on that there were more black people who owned houses mm -hmm. all through the 60s and the 70s than there are today yeah so it's it's um, it, the whole uh, landscape of Portland is just changing, yeah. and I just don't feel like it's you know my city anymore. It's yeah. it's really sad to see it happen. Yeah. Um, what I will say is that at this point we have more people of color who actually own businesses as a number, mm -hmm. and what can we do now to actually learn from the lessons of the past mm -hmm. and support them? You know, we're yeah. seeing the city you know having billions of dollars in contracting um, every biennium, mm -hmm. um, but how much of that goes to women and minorities is yeah. very little. So I think that even though we can look back and continue to say, oh, we did some messed up things, mm -hmm. um, the city has such a huge leverage point right now, and we're seeing a uh, new conversation because of a Trump presidency mm -hmm. of this thing called municipal disobedience. And so I think that we are actually more open-minded in terms of the tools that we can use mm -hmm. to empower our most vulnerable communities. Yeah. So even though we had some really bad past and we have a very orange future that's very bad, um, what can we do now uh, to leverage these voices and leverage better yeah. policies to make progress? Yeah. And I don't know if you, you guys probably have heard that um, Ted Wheeler said that Portland would be a sanctuary city. Mm -hmm. Chloe for, Daly did as well. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's wonderful. And I'm yeah. so, and, and you know, because I was, I was disappointed when Trump won. I mean, I was just, I was shocked, like everyone else. It's not what I saw coming, you know. Um, and I, I just can't imagine it. Um, he's such a crooked person in every way, shape, and form. And um, when I when I heard that uh, that that story, you know, that Ted Wheeler had said that, I was just so heartened because it's like, yeah, you know, you can do things, I guess, but just stay out of Oregon. <laughs> but um, <laughs> you know, but uh, yeah. So, what do you guys? Um, what's going on for you guys in the future? Jobs or any other things you're doing? Well, I'd love to hear more. Maybe Greg can tell us something <laughs> about Portland's resistance. Just talk about what that is, how that came about, because I heard about it a few days after the election, but I've been involved so far, but I... Uh. As did I. <laughs> um, so Portland's resistance is something that was started in the wake of the Trump protests, um, just trying to have an organized, centralized location and a message for these protests, because if we are just anti-Trump, then we go out in the streets and we scream we don't like Trump, and then nothing changes. So um, moving that towards policies <laughs> that insulate ourselves, not in the terms of walls or something like that, but insulate ourselves via policy from the policies of Donald Trump, things like uh, remaining a sanctuary city, um, which that fight is not over yet. We need to make sure that that language is strong because um, right. there's different forms of what a sanctuary city looks like. Mm -hmm. um, and in fighting against uh, or to make sure that we still receive our federal funding and the funding exchange of dollars that goes on between that. Um, but there are a list of things that I think that Portland and, and Portland activists and politicians and organizations and advocates have been talking about for a long time moving t for and towards such as rent control or, or making our air not suck. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, and and yeah. so um, those types of things, getting those done because they need to be done now with a coming Trump presidency um, and accelerated and moved towards even during the Trump presidency. So Portland's resistance was a group formed to give a message to the people in the streets. Um, uh, and since then, uh, we've been organizing like basically 24-7 mm -hmm. to most effectively make those policies come true and, and to get our messaging down. And, and mm -hmm. it's just 24-7 work. And uh, But it's been a lot of fun working with people like Cameron and a lot of others sure. on, on Portland's resistance. Do you want to talk about the recent protest arrests and what happened to you and Cameron and your, your, your friend Kat? Um, sure. So I was arrested. 
um, during a student march. Um, it was a march led by students, directed and organized by students, and we were there just because these kids have never been in the streets for a protest before, just so that we could explain the tactics of the police, or when the police make this move so we could say what is going on so that we could remove the element of fear. Because if there was none of that, and then the police swarm or arrest all or beat all these kids, who knows if they're going to continue to be a part of the political process right. in this manner. Yeah. Um, so we were there just to keep everybody safe, <coughs> protected, and make sure that their message um, was disseminated in the best way possible. Um, and during that, uh, the police targeted myself, Micah Rhodes, and Kat Stevens, um, who are three people that coincidentally are on our executive committee of Portland's resistance. Um, and we're the only three people that are were arrested at that day. Um, and we were arrested, um, and since then the ACLU has come out uh, in support of us and against targeted arrests. And we have a lot of images of the brutality that happened that night. Many of have, have been seen, and many, especially the most egregious uh, images of that arrest have not yet been seen. Um, so moving forward with the ACLU or other attorneys to see what the best course of action is going mm -hmm. forward. Um, but all of my charges were dropped, at least for now. They were non-complainted. They could bring them back. Um, but I doubt they will because I didn't do anything wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we watched the news and we were pretty surprised about what happened. But that's um, the tactic of people who want to control um, the leaders, people who want to take the leaders out of operation. They go they go for the leaders, you know. And when the violence ever, or the destruction rather, um, happened at any of the protests, there was a cry from the community that the police need to step up and deal with it. Um, and the response from the community was, or from the police, was then to just start arresting indiscriminately peaceful protesters mm -hmm. um, to get people off the street. And then those peaceful protesters get blamed for the destruction when basically not any of those people were arrested during those protests um, for any of the destruction that happened. Right. So I think that it's wrong and should be illegal that over a hundred people in, um, are arrested for peacefully protesting, which is their right to do, um, mm -hmm. and then all their charges are dropped. That should reflect very poorly upon our police uh, association or our police mm -hmm. bureau <laughs> that they are arresting these people and the DA is consistently saying they did nothing wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's been kind of interesting. Um, I don't know if you guys watch SNL the way I do, but Dave Chappelle was on two weeks ago. Uh, he, yeah. mentioned, he mentioned um, the Portland white riot, is what he called it. And what's interesting to me is that I had people on my friends list who really thought Portland was burning in the same way that yeah. Ferguson, Missouri yeah. was burning. And it's like, yeah. I think there was one newspaper container that was set on fire. I know. And I had to tell one of my friends, yeah. no, Portland's not burning. It's not like that. Um, <laughs> so it's kind of funny. Yeah, I remember I uh, used, uh, I got a cab uh, the day after one of those protests. And uh, the person who was driving uh, said to me, man, that day that riot happened was the darkest day in Portland history. And I'm sure Don <laughs> as well would probably think, we could tell you about some dark days of Portland history. Because yeah, um, <laughs> David Chappelle was right. Like, yeah. even though uh, it was Amateurs. sad to see that there were things <laughs> damaged during this uh, event. Um, yeah. The, yeah, exactly. Like the <laughs> organizers did a story and said that 90% of the businesses who were damaged were able to pay for that with insurance. Yeah. And we had, you know, nobody was killed. Nobody was, you know, grateful, you know, uh, maimed or anything. Yeah. Um, and people got a, a message across. So I heard, I heard something like there was ten thousand dollars worth of damage, and then I heard there was a million dollars worth of damage. And the I number was like, keeps a going. A million? Yeah. Seriously? That just didn't make sense to me. But anyway. Um. <laughs> So, um, so what are you guys uh, planning on doing um, in the next few days? specifically. Well, I think that right now is a very big moment. We're seeing a lot happening in this country around the Dakota Access Pipeline. The yeah. Army Corps of Engineers is trying to shut down this uh, movement of people led by Indigenous Voices. Um, we're also seeing a lot of work happening locally. Uh, Portland Tenants United just launched a Keep Portland House campaign mm -hmm. where they're talking about um, basic renter protections that yeah. don't exist really in this country yeah. at all. Um, they're working to um, stop no cause evictions. It's a serious issue in Portland. They're talking about moratorium on rent control. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, moratorium on rent increases. Mm -hmm. And then another big thing that I want people to talk about is that city councils bring forward a voter owned elections proposal in mm -hmm. December. Okay. And this is a great way to level the playing field so that okay. people like Fred, um, who want to run for office but aren't entrenched with moneyed interests, mm -hmm. can actually run and have a voice and actually have cool. a much better shot at 
being elected. Okay, well, I want to thank you both for being on the show. Thank you. And um, maybe we Thanks. can have you on in the future sometime. Anytime. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. You are watching Oregon Voters Digest. This program can be seen again on these channels on these dates and times. Tell a friend. You are watching Oregon Voters Digest, and this is the second half of the show. Um, the first half of the show, we had Cameron Witten and Gregory Robert McKelvey. And for the second half of the show, I have Sean Davis on again. He was on okay. last week, uh, and Bruce interviewed him last week, Bruce Broussard. And I wanted to interview him this week because I wanted to talk about different things like writers yeah, and good. poetry and art and painting. <laughs> So basically, um, and I also wanted to mention again that you won the Humanitarian of the Year Award for Portland. Well, thank you. Yeah, that yeah. was that's nice. Uh, it's 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 hard to win that when you have people like Cameron and Gregory out there doing <laughs> stuff. You know, there's they're so wonderful. Many, there's so many yeah. great people in Portland doing mm -hmm. amazing things. Yeah. You know, and I'm I'm uh, yeah, it's humbling for sure. Yeah. There's uh, so many other people could have got. And what was the um, the agency was? Um, it's the uh, the Portland Human Rights Commission. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they, they gave you the award for your work with veterans at the at Post 134. Yeah, we uh, over. You know, I, I I just I always say this, but my wife corrects me. I always say I'm just a teacher. You know, I mm -hmm. just teach college, and she's like, "Don't say you're just a teacher." <laughs> but uh, you know, seeing the other people who won that award, they're they're social workers. Mm -hmm. They're they're people that are leaders in the community, trying to help out a lot of other people. And, mm -hmm. Um, I do what I can, but uh, it's just, you know, I don't know. I just seem like, oh, man, I got to do more. <laughs> well, I think the great thing about Post uh, 134 is it's just such a great space. Mm -hmm. and, 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 it's, and you've turned it into a wonderful gathering place for all kinds of people, for um, writers and poets and artists and musicians. And it's just, it's a wonderful space. It's the perfect space for, you know, you know 50 or 100 people to get together and mm -hmm. just support each other and and this is what you know this is what people did in, in the in the 20s you know and with yeah. the uh, you know mm -hmm. F Scott Fitzgerald I mean this is what mm -hmm. artists and writers do they get together and they need a space to yeah. congregate and, yeah. and I'm hoping that we're starting a movement there mm -hmm. I really do want to start one and but on on the flip side of that there's no reason why this can't be happening at every American Legion post mm -hmm. in the state of Oregon if not the country yeah. you know maybe not the writing or the music it depends on what their their community is into mm -hmm. but it's really bringing back uh, community and having the veterans mm -hmm. who come back from wars uh, be a part of their community again mm -hmm. so yeah uh, so it's on 21st in Alberta mm -hmm. 2104 that's uh, a really great Alberta area Street. I love yeah. that spot it's right in the arts yeah. district it's really yep. great yeah and that's the area that my husband, Don Dupay, um, that was his district when he was a cop in the 60s. Yeah, it was very different. We've had a lot of conversations about how <laughs> different it is mm -hmm. <laughs> now, yeah. but yeah. So, yeah. so what are you doing um, in terms of writing? Are you writing anything? Are you I am. I'm, I'm writing two books. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, well, I'm trying to finish one, mm -hmm. and uh, so I'm editing it, and I'm mm -hmm. writing another book. I'm writing a book about my experiences uh, as a wildland firefighter in the summertime. So oh, it's nice. a novel, but... Sure. Uh, and, and that's the more marketable one. This mm -hmm. other one is like 800 pages and I just can't stop working on it mm -hmm. and rewriting it and adding new parts to it. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it, it's ridiculous. Is it a novel? Or? Yeah, but it's okay. just, it's, 
no one, no one's gonna read it. <laughs> it's one of those things. I mean, it takes like a hundred pages before you even meet the main character, which mm-hmm. is ridiculous. Mm-hmm. And but I, I love working on it, you know. And it's, it's but it's kind of just gone crazy, and it's, mm-hmm. it's everywhere, and it's so big. Uh, but um, I will finish it eventually, and then mm-hmm. actually work on my uh, fire. Mm-hmm. Uh, novel, which is probably marketable, which people mm-hmm. will probably want to read. So I'm cool, cool. Yeah. I'm 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 actually working on a book too. Um, I'm putting together a book of um, of memoir essays and uh, fiction stories, and mm-hmm. um, it's been a lot of fun. Uh, my husband Don and I started writing fiction about a year ago, for the first time ever, mm-hmm. and um, it's so different from creative nonfiction. Oh, yeah. um, or memoir writing is just it's very freeing in a way you still have to do research you know sure and things, yeah. but it's just it's just like the creativity level is just out of out of this world I mean you can just do I anything. honestly because my <laughs> first book was creative nonfiction and honestly I think I do more research writing a novel than <laughs> <laughs> writing you know like this stuff happened to me I don't have to research I, I have had so much fun writing fiction and then you you um you can write about something that happened to you invariably you know writers write what they know so they incorporate some kind of autobiographical information in their in their fiction um but i've also written just crazy short stories that had very little to do with anything i ever experienced and Mm -hmm. i wrote them because they were just a hoot to write they're fun right (laughs) Yeah, yeah yeah what are you reading right now what am I reading? Um, I'm reading a novel. That's funny that you would ask. Thank you for asking. Yeah. <laughs> I'm reading a novel nice. by Janet Fitch. She wrote White Oleander, which oh, I loved. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's called Paint It Black. Wow. And it's about a girl who, like a punk rock girl, whose boyfriend commits suicide in the middle 80s. In the so, 80s. Paint yeah. It Black, that's a Stone <laughs> song, right? That's yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. And it's, it's, it's different. I mean, it's definitely written in Janet Fitch's style of writing. Mm-hmm. I loved White Oleander. Like, that was just, and then the film was amazing too, but of course the book was better. But um, she's an amazing writer. She's a little wordy. She could probably have used a good editor for both books. Mm-hmm. Um, but still, her, 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 <laughs> yeah, her writing is just um, amazing. And I loved White Oleander. So that's the book I'm reading. And um, uh, I'm, I tend to read two to three books uh, yeah, at too. a time. <laughs> I listen to one, too, you know, because I drive around a lot. Yeah. But I'm trying to listen to the, the brothers, Car- Car- I never get it right, Carmen Alzov, help me out. Uh, uh, Car- Car- yeah, right. Car- <laughs> uh, I'm you know, sorry. I know, but you know, I'm trying to get through it. I'm listening to an audio book. Oh, that really book. Difficult. Yeah. Oh, the, uh, sure. Yeah. My, my, um, about Jewish life. No, the, it's uh, Dostoevsky's uh, The Brothers Karmanov. Car- uh, yeah, we're gonna sit here and not find. It. I can't pronounce the thing. I'm trying to. I'm trying to get through it. It's really hard. Uh, Dostoevsky. Okay. Dostoevsky. I've no, I, you know, and that's one but, thing I've never read him, and I have to because I really need to read Crime and Punishment. Well, I've tried so many times, but you know, I, I've also uh, uh, I read the uh, the Sound and the Fury, and I'm afterwards mm-hmm. I'm like, how come I didn't get it? I don't like it. You know, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> I know people are like, what the heck. At least I'm trying. I'm right. attempting the yeah. classics, yeah. Uh, you know, because I have read a lot. Uh, but I, uh, I, I am still determined to read um, *Remembrance of Things Past* by Proust. Yeah. Um, oh, Proust. Yeah. yeah. Good luck. I know. I'm not even going to attempt that one. So I, it's not it's and it's one of those books you really can't even you can't read out loud. You really mm-hmm. have to read it silently because to read it out loud is just it's just nothing but run-on sentences and it mm-hmm. goes on forever. But it's a really a good book. I mean, because. Mm-hmm. It's really intimate and everything. I'll have to take your word for it. But but <laughs> I'm also reading uh, Ben Percy's Deadlands. I'm finishing that up. It's uh-huh. a huge book. He's he's a friend of mine, but he's gone, he's on fire. I mean, he, now he's he's writing uh, comic books too. Mm-hmm. He's writing mm-hmm. the Green Arrow and uh, the new James Bond series. Oh, putting neat. that out. So <laughs> and I think he has like a TV show in the works. So he's I a think, great guy. I think one of the problems with a lot of the classics is that they're written in such extreme passive voice. Mm-hmm. That it's really hard to get through it. Yeah, well, I mean, we are just, we are a product of our, we're, how yeah. we've uh, our, our society, right? Yeah. We just want it now. Uh, but and, I don't and, know. and 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 writing has like the voice of point of view has changed. Like, mm-hmm. um, uh, you know, there's a book um, uh, of human bondage by W. Somerset Maugham, and then there's also um, the Way of All Flesh, which is kind of similar to that. And they're written in that extreme passive voice and really wordy and just constant run-on sentences. Dracula by Bram Stoker is just constant like run-on sentences. That's, uh, the, well, it's epistolatory, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's yeah. all written as if it's 
uh, letters or articles. And yeah. That's pretty yeah. cool. It's a change up of a style. Yeah. I'm, I'm kind of, I did something like that that I still have to edit, but, uh, and I like, I like changing it up. It's a lot of fun. Uh, I just read, uh, also Paul Dage's, uh, Trout Kill or Trout huh. Run. It's his trilogy that he's doing, mm-hmm. uh, local writer, uh, reading City of Weird, which is the City of Weird. Yeah. The new from Force Avenue Press. Oh, wow. Uh, it's been out. It was like number one bestseller at Powell's. Oh, my gosh. And I got to be in that. It's an anthology of 30 different really? writers. Really? Is it called well, The City of Weird or just City of Weird? It's uh, City of Weird. Just City of Weird. Just City, City of Weird. weird. <laughs> Finally, you pronounced 30, it right. <laughs> 30 Tales of... Uh, uh, it's, 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 I'll have to find again, that. Again, Forest Avenue Press. Mm-hmm. Uh, Gigi Little uh, mm-hmm. edited it. And uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. It's just a bunch of either... I mean, some of them like really, really short stories. Some of them mm-hmm. a little longer. There's funny ones. There's mm-hmm. sad ones, and it's all about Portland. I and, love uh, anthologies. I love that w- the book I'm working on, it's called uh, Burnside Field Lizard and Collected Stories. Oh, awesome! That's cool. And it's about the main story. Burnside Field Lizard is about you know a woman that was a prostitute. I mean, I saw mm-hmm. a lot of a lot of poverty and a lot of marginalized oh, yeah. people when I used to work as a hotel maid <laughs> mm, in the okay. 80s. Um, That's one of those jobs like a taxi driver or something. Yeah. You're going oh to see a lot of things. <laughs> hotel work is actually really interesting. Hotel and motel work, it's actually mm-hmm. really interesting. And I really enjoyed it. But um, but it's a collection of memoir and also short fiction stories. Oh, wow. And um, uh, and it's all centered in Portland. And mm-hmm. it's all basically dealing with, with my recollections of Portland. Mm-hmm. And um, um, it's very Portland-esque. Because, you know, it, I mean, it really is true, write what you know. I, I can't write about some other city that I've never been to. You know, I, I know the geography of Portland. I know the landscape. I need to focus mm-hmm. on Portland. Um, and I'm, and it's also uh, about, you know, the marginalized people that I saw. Yeah. You know, I saw quite a few. A lot of weirdness. <laughs> well, my story in City of Weird is about Post 134. Well, it's about the bartender there who goes out and helps people and all oh, kinds cool. of crazy stuff. Yeah. Cool. So. I'm going to look for that. I'm going to look for that. So what are you planning on doing in the future, in the next few months, in the next year? Uh, you know, I don't know. I, going back into politics, maybe, I, I think that we live in a really <laughs> weird time. And, and because we live in such a weird time, I think we need better people into politics and we need more artists. I yes. think those two things are really going to save us. That's right. And you know, the thing about Portland is because Portland is so different now, because the rents have skyrocketed. Yeah. All the artists, artists are, are fleeing Portland. Exactly and it's, right. it's, it's going to turn, I mean, it's just like, um, I was at a panel a few months ago and Stuart Emmons was there and he said, I don't want Portland to become another San Francisco, but nobody I does mean, except for, yeah, I don't know people with the money, <laughs> I guess. It, money hasn't mattered to people of Portland for such a long time. Yeah. I, mean, I got here in 99 and living in, in the houses with a bunch of crazy artists. Yeah. And, and we didn't care about trying to, you know, buckle down and make a career. And people can say what they will about that. But we mm-hmm. did make this city a great place. Yeah. Yeah. All of these artists that worked at, at coffee shops, or worked at breweries, or worked mm-hmm. at bike shops, or groomed pets... It's not yeah. a coincidence that we are number one in beer, coffee, right. dogs, right. bicycles. Right. All these artists did that right. uh, because yeah. they didn't have to choose their careers over uh, trying to do something like dot coms or IT. Mm-hmm. But now we're forcing them to choose, you yeah. know, and they can either get another job where they don't have enough time to do art or they can just get out of town and go find some other place the, to the do whole, that. That's the, more whole, affordable. the whole landscape in Portland is, is being changed and yeah. not for the better because no. we're losing that element. And I can remember a time when, you know, if we needed to move, you know, when my uh, ex-husband and I were raising my daughter, who's now 24, if we needed to move, it was kind of a hassle, but we could do it. Now, mm-hmm. you it's, have like to a, way out of time. it's like a life and death thing. I mean, can I afford it? I mean, mm-hmm. uh, you know. It's a whole um, lifestyle change. It, it, it's 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 ridiculous, and God, you know, God help anyone who tries to buy a house mm-hmm. it, now. I mean, I it's, it's really impossible. Um, it, I and just, renting is even more. I yeah, mean, <laughs> I yeah. mean, renting is more than a mortgage. You just yeah. can't come up with a down payment and yeah. try to, and you know, and then you know, you're going to spend the last thirty years of your lives paying it off or so. It's, it's insane. It's it really is. It's really discouraging. And but that's why we need better people yes. in positions to help. Yeah. other people and and yeah. i think we need more artists because uh i think art really is a reflection it could be a reflection of society and, mm-hmm. and like what's going on and and have like a sensible voice because thinking that this president is the norm is insanity to me 
You know? It is. Uh, it really is. You know, I, I've lost a couple of friends on Facebook because I don't support Donald Trump, and I've made it pretty clear that I don't support Donald Trump um, because of just all the things that are so horribly wrong with him yeah. and the fact that he really is kind of an aberration in so many ways. Um, but it's, it's just sad and discouraging to see um, how Portland, everything that made Portland so, quote, livable mm -hmm. and so, you know, keep Portland weird, all those things are, are going. Yeah. And it's and the divide between the, the haves and the have nots, the rich and the poor, it, it, it the uh, the divide is wider every management day. Management and from the city council. I'm I'm mm -hmm. I'm hopeful because Chloe got on the city council, mm -hmm. she uh kicked Novick out. She did. I, we were happy when we yeah. heard that she won <laughs> for uh, that I, reason. I'd love for you to have her on the show and talk about what she's yeah. gonna do, you know, that'd be yeah. awesome. Yeah. Uh, I, I I like Amanda Fritz, you know, she's mm -hmm. very approachable from she came to the post and handed out awards for some of the guys mm -hmm. that went to Haiti to save mm -hmm. lives. Um, you know, uh, Ted Wheeler coming in, I, I'm hopeful, I'm optimistic about mm -hmm. this. You know, I did even, I even applied to be on part of his team. I mm -hmm. hope that that works out. Yeah. Um, but I think we still need some house cleaning to do. I was yeah. reading an article just today about our education here in Portland and how they've, uh, you know, the city's budget for that. They've, they've what, blown through 70% of the budget, only 25% of the work's done. And uh, Saltzman's uh, answer to that was, well, it's just poor management, but we're going to learn from our mistakes. Sure. You know, I'm like, I don't know. What, what's frustrating about city council in Portland is that they it, they seem to feel they're untouchable. Yeah. And that they can just say... For a long say, time they have been, though. Right. And, and that they can just do things, you know, and then say, well, you know, come up with these really pat answers. Well, you know, we're investigating this situation. And, uh, well, and, Novik and, was and, like, hey, if they don't like it, vote me out. Right. Obviously, did. we didn't like it. And they did. He, <laughs> so. you know, the thing about Steve Novik, I have to say, um, I went to a city council session um, in November of last year, and it was for the Lotus Hotel and for the Ancient Order of the United Workman Temple to mm -hmm. be to be saved. Um, obviously, it didn't work because it really doesn't matter what Portlanders say. You know, they go and they you know, they speak their mind in front of a lot of the city commissioners, and it's just like, oh, okay, you said what you wanted, we're just going to do what we want. That's, that's the, the feeling money. I get. There's that's the money feeling involved I get. now. It's billions you know? of dollars. And, and After the, the Oregon the, Comp Plan, they say, well, our population is going to double. <laughs> that just, in their heads, they I see know. dollar signs. Right. Billions of dollars right. going to be made in development. Right. And that's no, it's not a coincidence that Saltzman is a developer from a developer family right. making right. $1.5 million on the side in development deals. Right. I mean, that should, that should be illegal to, in, in my I, eyes. I agree. I really do. He seems like a nice guy, but yeah, I know about his his you know activities other than being a commissioner. He you know owns yeah. property and I would love to talk to him just to see. Maybe I have mm -hmm. the wrong impression, mm -hmm. but just from what I've read, you know, yeah. uh, you know, Brad Schmidt does a great job with Oregonian covering mm -hmm. like what goes on down there. Uh, Dirk, Dirk from uh, the Mercury does mm -hmm. a good job. Uh, so you know, maybe I got to go come to more city council meetings. I try to make as many as I can, but I do work, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. Uh, but I, I think that we still have a lot of work to do uh, well, for our I, local when government. I, when, when, I went, when Don and I went to that city council meeting um, in 2015, what struck me about Steve Novick was how prickly he is. Oh, yeah. Um, he just made no bones about it. And he kept using the term poor people instead of low income. I don't. I think the term poor people is as a dated term, mm. and it comes. it's a loaded term. Um, it comes with a lot of judgment. Um, almost a moral judgment and the way he said it you know he just and he was so condescending during that meeting and yeah. it, it was just like wow most of the meetings um, that i've been to he, he was like that too just yeah spouting off um quotes that had nothing to do right. with what vote they're gonna do uh yeah. you know just and his, i mean his attitude things. really it, you know he clearly was not um he was clearly his own worst enemy mm -hmm. because if you're gonna have that kind of a of a elitist condescending patronizing attitude you can expect that you're going to turn people off mm -hmm. and he turned a lot of people off and he lost yeah and i think portland's going to be better off for it i am happy that chloe is focusing on um, affordable housing for sure because what about the portlanders who've lived here their yeah. whole lives what about me and my husband don mm -hmm. we're not rich you know um what about portlanders who've lived here you know for 40 50 60 years should should they be pushed out just what because they're the artists the artists you who know think they think yeah. they're poor people or the ed uneducated who just they don't choose right. to go to college at the time you know right yeah i mean there's a huge uh, population that doesn't have a voice right now yeah. And and you're right. I mean, they lived in in their in the West Side, and they didn't even look at what's going on here. Yeah. Uh, but now I think I'm hoping. I'm really interested. What's going to happen 
in uh, two years, mm -hmm. you know, when those other seats are up. Who's going to run for them? Who, who's who's going to be up in uh, two years? Fish and, and Saltzman. Oh, okay. All right, yeah. yeah, and, and yeah. so, I mean, I'm looking to see Sarah Anrone. Is she going to run for one of them? Mm -hmm. Even Jesse Sponberg, is he going to run should, again? You should run again. Uh, are Steve you going to run again? I would hate to run and be uh, butt heads with these guys that I know that they're going to do. I mean, Steve... Uh, I, um, Stuart Emmons, I think he's going to be a powerhouse. He's going to mm -hmm. he's going to have some people behind him. I'd love to help him out. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think Sarah would be able to do it too. So if they're both running against those seats, uh, I heard some other people that are from really big uh, momentum behind them with like PTU and some other stuff. Uh, they might be running. Mm -hmm. So I would hate to like detract from what they're doing. I, mm -hmm. I'm I'm fine with not. I, I was impressed like with that. Stuart Emmons when I saw him speak at the PSU panel um, mm -hmm. several months ago. I was definitely impressed with him. Yeah. Um, I think he's definitely got a good future. Um, yeah, so I would Portland. hate to fight against them. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd rather try to get do everything I can to help them out. It's, it's really not about me being in a position. It's about just the position being filled by somebody that will do mm -hmm. good, you know. Do you, do you have a, do you, what do you think about this? Do you think there's been kind of a climate change in the nation? It seems like people are just really turning on each other, and there's this, like, lack of empathy for those less fortunate. And, you know, mm. my whole life I've been kind of, a, I guess, a progressive or a liberal. You know, I, I, I've always had a lot of compassion for people that I know are simply doing the best they can. They might be disabled, they might be unemployable, they might be mentally ill. I don't, I certainly don't hate them, but you see so much animosity in people yeah. lately. Well, nobody, not everyone fits into society, you know, it's just, just how it is. I mean, just the, yeah. as humans as animals, you know, not yeah. everyone was going to fit. But we will always have those people, and right. to turn around and hate them, it doesn't do us any good. Right. It doesn't do us any good. Yeah, that's that's the that's I agree with that. Um, uh, to, but to, like what you're talking about, I understand. Like, yes, we are in a chaotic time, and people do seem like they're turning on each other. But I think that there is a lot of potential there. Mm -hmm. um, I think the good that can come out of a Trump presidency is that people are going to get more involved. I've already had a lot of people come to us and say. Hey, what you're doing at the post? I want to help out. What can sure, I do? Right. Uh, I'm gonna be a part of that. And that came from. There's no complaint. They can't be complacent anymore. You can't right. be on the sidelines. It was such you a shock. You gotta be in the game. You know, yeah. it was such a shock. What happened? Um, you know, Trump winning. Nobody saw it coming. Mm -hmm. um, and then also, I wanted to mention. Um, uh, Ted Wheeler has said that Portland will be a sanctuary city. I have and students whose parents are undocumented. You know, and, and uh, it breaks your heart to 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 read like because i have i always have them write about current events mm -hmm. and like read the saying, fear, like, yeah the fear that, i don't know if if my if right. i come home my parents will even right. be there you know i'm proud that he said that and and uh, you know what, what what's fascinating to me is since trump became president watching the news and here in oregon listening to the stories of acts of racism mm -hmm. i think there was a girl at a, a, an oregon high school and um, some of her classmates were telling her, your parents are, you know, you're going to have to pack up and leave. I mean, mm -hmm. just the, 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 the hurtfulness, yeah. the, the viciousness. And then there was a, the black woman in, Be in Beaverton that was, yeah, that right was hit with that. the brick. Yeah. I mean, it's as if Trump and his expressed values and beliefs give these people and his language, the power of language is really mm -hmm. demonstrated when you yeah. consider Trump gives these people the permission to be hateful. Yeah, but I also want to say that I don't believe everyone who voted for Trump is a racist. Okay. I think there's so many people that are very desperate mm -hmm. for a change. I mean, yeah. you, you can see the temperament of our country. We're <laughs> sick of corrupt politicians. Mm -hmm. Sick of it. We've had it for generations. Yeah. And so the DNC allows Hillary Clinton, whether or not it happened, perceived it's perceived that she is one of those corrupt right. politicians. Right. Um, to be up there, that perception damaged her. And yeah. people were like, no, I'm not doing it. Yeah. And they didn't, uh, like Noam Chomsky said today, they didn't understand that Trump is is not like the lesser of the, the two evils. Not at all. He might be an outsider, but mm -hmm. no, he, I mean, just, you see, like, Fidel Castro dies, his reaction versus what President Obama's reaction, just uh, his tweets uh, today about, him winning the uh, not only the electoral college by a landslide, that. but I, saw that. I, I if you count them, if you don't count the millions of people who cheated, I mean, that's not presidential. Oh, you he's know? not presidential in any way. Not in any <laughs> way, and, and and I mean, you, I was taught in the military, you respect the office. Sure. It doesn't matter. You respect the office. 
no one's going to respect him. You saw today yeah. on Google Maps, they changed it for nine hours, Trump Tower, Dump Tower. <laughs> I mean, no one's going to respect this man. And, yeah. and if we're going to be the laughing stock of the entire world when we were the, the strongest nation right. in the world, I right. mean, that's going to really do a lot of damage. Yeah. I'm hoping that it goes synthesis, antithesis, or uh, thesis, uh, antithesis, and synthesis. And at the end of his... Uh, his, his administration, we find somebody who will uh, level us out and, and yeah. give us uh, what we need. Or he could know. be impeached because the yeah. professor of law, I think his name is Alan Bateman or something, Alan something or other, he's a professor of law and he has successfully predicted who would be president for the last 30 years. Yeah. He says he's going to be impeached. If they started impeachment processes, uh, if someone Just started one that... one tweet about a Miss America while he's in office. Well, I mean... That's all it's going to take. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's insanity. He, he but has, then we have Mike Pence. Yeah, and, well, I know, it's like, what's worse? I know, I don't know. <laughs> and then already, he's already breaking his promises. For so, sure, all Trump of, Trump all is, of Because the reality is, it's just like, I read an article somewhere, he's not an ideologue, he's malleable. Mm -hmm. And well, they're already see, manipulating Obama him. Obama was the devil until now he needs right. help, and now he's a great guy. Right. And, now, and now, you know, you're going you're gonna to incarcerate uh, Hillary Clinton? No, they're good people, I don't want to hurt them. <laughs> no, well, his uh, Conway, Kelly and Conway is today said, like, I don't know why she's attacking him. We might go back to thinking about sending somebody after her if she doesn't stop this uh, recount for the votes in Wisconsin. Oh, you mean um, <laughs> uh, the other, um, what was her name? Um, kind of uh, his, a his momentary brain fart here. His <laughs> campaign manager, Kellyanne Conway, said oh, that okay. on CNN today. Okay. It's like, Trump's so magnanimous and he's trying not to go after her, but if she keeps doing this recount in Wisconsin, we're going to look at and the that's, options. And that's Jill Stein who's doing the recount, right? Yeah, but uh, Hillary Clinton decided to uh, oh. jump in on that too. Oh, I see. Okay, mm -hmm. I was I was looking at news this morning, but I wasn't I didn't see that yet. I'll have to Google that. It's yeah, <laughs> it's 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 crazy. It's it's yeah, the whole well, the I, we're going to find out what happens December nineteenth. You know, that's going to be pretty. You know, when the delegates decide, because I mean. Oh, is that the not the day they decide? Yeah, I mean, the, things could change. Yeah. You know? Well, my and wife and I are going to be on a little vacation. That's our anniversary. <laughs> oh, that's cool. Well, it's Kelly's my my wife's birthday. Uh -huh. We got married the day after her birthday. Neat. So you, where are you going? You're gonna. Go? Uh, we're gonna go to the coast. Oh, nice. Get some crabs. Nice. Yes. Eat some. My dad uh, used to crab. live at the coast. Yeah, oh, wonderful. It. So, we'll find out how the world's changed when we get back. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So it was good to have you on. Well, thank you so much. And, I appreciate uh, it. Being and here. tune in tune in again next time when Bruce Broussard is back from his uh, vacation. He went to see family, uh, I think, out of state uh, for the holiday, for the Thanksgiving holidays. You going to say bye so. this time? <laughs> you said you're going to say bye this time. No. All right. <laughs> I'm making a deer. Are you making a deer? <laughs> a really crazy one. I like it. I like that. I like all the pink and the blue. <laughs>